I'm delighted to be able to chat today with Professor Kathleen Hall Jameson, who is a professor of communication at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School for Communication and also directs the Annenberg Public Policy Center there. She's here at USC Annenberg's Media Center because she has just received the 2018 Ev Rogers Award. We're going to talk about politics, reality, Putin, Trump, and uh, have a little fun, I hope. Welcome. Glad Thank to have you, you so here. so good to be here. So you said something in your talk that uh, I had not heard before, and rather than my mangle it in uh, recollection, it was a quote from Putin about facts. Uh, the, I, I was paraphrasing, uh, but the, it, this was a person talking about Putin's philosophy and basically said Putin's goal is ensuring that there is no longer within the, the, the great democracies will there be a respect for what is knowable and what is factual. Everything will be able to be disputed. And at the point at which we have that, um, we, we would actually have a world in which you can't deliberate, and that ultimately makes our system of government feasible. So it was, it was a remark about what Putin was up to. And when you go and look across what the various Russian interventions have looked like across the other systems that are like ours, you could say that that's a plausible theory of what's happening, not that there's a specific goal. I mean, it, it's, it's clear that they started out not thinking they had any chance of electing or defeating someone, but rather they're going to make Hillary Clinton's life difficult, uh, but rather that the underlying, they were going to take the tensions inside the democratic system and make everything problematic in a way that would be so clear to everybody else that we think our system was badly broken and you wouldn't know what to believe. Would I be unfair to characterize our system and potentially some political actors in the same way? You could say that there are some kinds of rhetorical moves that accomplish that end and that we ought to worry about that. I mean, if, if you fake to, news, for yeah. example. Well, at the point which you say that everything I dislike is fake news, as opposed to saying I have a definition underlying what constitutes mm -hmm. illegitimate, legitimate, and among other things, the fact that we now have accepted fake news and even use it is appalling because it says that now we will attach the word fake to news. If it's fake, it's not news. Um, the, the word I want to use, the phrase I want to use, is viral deception, um, because I want to capture that it spreads uncritically, its source is, is disguised, and when you try to critique it, nothing happens. If anything, you know, it, it gets worse. It doesn't follow the traditional journalism norms, in other words, and I want to say VD, viral deception, <laughs> so that you get the negative affect. I don't know why that hasn't caught on. I tried. I went on CNN and I, and I said, stop calling it fake news, call it viral deception. Uh, because then you, you indicate how it's... And great. did you use the I acronym? Said, yes, I said VD. I said, and here, I said, here, this is what I think you ought to think. You ought to think, VD, do you want it? No. <laughs> If you catch it, do you want to cure it? Yes. You certainly don't want to spread it. And if someone else has it, you certainly don't want them to give it to you. It's made in heaven for cable news. Yes. And so I, I renamed it. I said it's VD. And, and the reason I wanted to make that move was if we, we all are starting to accept that there is such a thing as fake news and we're pretending it's descriptive of something when in fact it is not, we've got to break our habit. And the way you break your habit is to create a whole new domain before you make the switch to the new term. So I wanted people to go through VD to get the negative affect of VD, I want to protect news's positive identity. And then I want you to ask, now what do you want to do about it? And my definition of how you create good language is you ask, what is the question you ask about it? And is the answer the answer that leads you to a discussion that's productive about the problem? If you say, well, is it like VD? Why is it like VD? Now we're indicating why we worry about it. Its virality is literally a characteristic of it. The fact that it spreads in, in ways that are very difficult to detect, the way a virus actually spreads, and it insinuates deception in ways that are very difficult to catch. All of that, and we want to quarantine it. So what do we want to do? Quarantine it, capture it, cure it. Uh, so I liked the transformation. I like carrying the affect over. More importantly, I like the actions it dictated. What do you call the act of delegitimizing any fact if you don't like it? I call it sextus empiricus. <laughs> so the and I made the mistake at one point. I was I was doing one of the more the uh, NPR morning shows, and I was tired. It was morning. I wasn't really awake, and in the course of a conversation, um, I said, and, and you know what we're really seeing here is a move akin to sextus empiricus's move against any premise that is offered, any evidence that is offered. And what sextus empiricus basically said is, 
You can end argument by challenging every premise and challenging every piece of evidence, and there's no place to start the argument from. You don't agree to anything. And I, I got a letter from someone, who's this is back in the age when people actually sent letters saying, I've been trying to find this, this sextist person. I assume they wrote a book. I'd like to read the book. And I said, well, yes, and it's actually been translated in English from Latin. Um, I thought it was really funny because, of course, I hadn't said anything about who Sextus Empiricus was. It was early in the morning for me, and I wasn't completely awake. One can imagine someone mistook it as sexting. Yes, yes, or, but that word hadn't been there yet. Oh, we, we didn't have that word yet. This just seemed like, I think, some exotic name to somebody. And I was explaining, actually inadvertently explaining its utility, because by virtue of saying he identified it, you could hear that to say, you want to end an argument? Here's what you do. Mm -hmm. So I was afraid maybe the person was looking for a guide to sophistry. Uh, but I, I would define it that way. You basically create a situation in which if you can challenge everything that is news by saying, I dislike it in some way, you can't ground a common understanding of reality anymore. And as a result, you and I are incapable of creating an engaged argument in which we can constructively evaluate what we know and don't know and what we can do about it if we think it's a problem. So I think, it, in fact, there, there are characteristics here of, that destabilize your capacity to engage. So to what degree do you think that has happened in the last year or two? Uh, I wrote a book with Joe Capello a long time ago that was called um, Echo Chamber, Rush Limbaugh and the Conservative Media Establishment. And as part of putting the data together for that, we also looked at liberal establishments. And the, the assumption was that you can create enough of a media stream, this is before social media, that people of like mind will only attend to it for their basic understanding. They will come in and sample the mainstream, but out of a frame of reference created in an ideological domain. And you could see it happening on the left, and you could see it happening on the right. And we were studying the emergence of it on the right, because Fox News had just come in, and we'd started studying it when Rush Limbaugh came out to the national stage. And what, what we came to understand as a result of that book, prior to social media, is the power of like-minded individuals to gather information consistent with like mind inside communities in which they reinforce each other. And in that environment, if you have it on the left and you have it on the right, at a certain point they can't talk to each other because they're not granting anything in common. And we've got to figure out a way to get to something that we will grant as knowable so that we can build enough engagement to have a Congress, to have deliberation that will get us productive solutions. The way you just put that, one might infer that you think there's a symmetry between the two sides. There's a psychological symmetry um, in that the, we all have a disposition to seek out things that we agree with. We all have a, a disposition to be highly critical of things that disagree with our basic assumptions. We all have a basic inclination to be highly uncritical about things that are any, anywhere within our, the support of our, of our beliefs. So we know that. I mean, the confirmation bias is not a liberal or conservative thing. It's a human thing. And the question becomes, at some times, are you more aware of it on one ideological side than another because it's more evident in what's happening in the politics on that side uh, than you are on the other side. But to say that it is only on one side is mistaken. And to figure out whether it's more on one side or another is, to me, an unproductive conversation. If what we mean is we've got enough of it on each side that we're having trouble engaging, we ought to figure out how to increase the likelihood that we're going to engage, even as we ask, because it's not that people inside these enclaves are not exposing. How do we increase the likelihood that we can engage in ways that, second problem, we don't just simply engage in ad hominem? I mean, we, we now have conventionalized the assumption that if you disagree with me, you are a bad person. And that makes it very problematic to deliberate. And there's a reason that when Jefferson put the rules for the House together, that he said that we don't call each other liars in the House of Representatives. So with very few exceptions, an impeachment hearing about perjury because someone has lied. If you call someone a liar in the House, you're taken down. And your defense is not the person lied. I mean, the, and Jefferson's idea was, if I call you a liar, then I can't deliberate with you. And if you have been called a liar, you will not deliberate with me. And Congress is a deliberative body. And so Congress is built on assuming the goodwill and integrity of the other. Even if the other doesn't really deserve it, we're going to ask as if the, uh, act as if the other does because we need to deliberate together. So skipping a few centuries, we yeah. have a member of Congress shouting out, you lie, yeah. to a president. And we have a president who uses the word liar, shattering norms. And you have uh, media who are now comfortable using the word lie about political leaders, sometimes indiscriminately. So I'm, I'm a purist. If, if I'm going to accuse someone of lying, I want to know and be able to show that it was deliberate. Mens rea. I do, yes. I want, and, and so 
most cases, I will not say someone has lied. I would need to know that they knew they were lying. Now, self-delusion is powerful. So, and, and self-delusion is worrisome in some ways. I'd rather have someone who is lying because at least they know what is accurate than someone who's self-deluded and thinks it's accurate when it is not because you actually have some hope with the first case. Trump that you don't says the of Putin when he denies meddling, Put, when Putin says it, he believes it. Yeah, and the question there, because the referent for he is not clear, is does he mean that Putin believes it or that he believes it? Oh. He, Trump, believes it. Because he can refer to himself in the third person, so. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and we do, too. I mean, you know, they're, so you would refer back to yourself in that sentence. I mean, for a moment, imagine that's a conversation between us, and he was, in that case, either referring to Putin or referring to Marty. You actually don't know in the construction of that sentence what the referent is. And one of the characteristics of analyzing Donald Trump's speech is you often don't know because he engages in a kind of associative you know, pattern of discourse where it's a little like reading Joycean prose without the continuity. So you say, how did he get from there to there to there? And what is that doing in the sentence? But in that case, I literally wrote that down and said, is he saying, that Putin believes it, in which case it's tautologically true, unless Putin, he thinks Putin is deceiving us and deceiving himself, or is he saying Trump believes Putin when Putin says it, and you can't tell from the grammatical construction. The press went with the assumption that he said he, Trump believes it, you can make a strong case from the structure of that sentence that you don't know what the referent was. And what happens inside your confirmation bias is exactly that. If I do not like Donald Trump. I do not think he ought to be president. I will read that one way. If I love Donald Trump, I believe he should be president. I will read it another way, depending on how I want that to be interpreted. And I can defend it either way linguistically. Sounds more like Borges than Joyce. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the, uh, you are a co-founder of factcheck.org. I am. And one of its premises, I assume, is that facts matter. And that facts exist. Dual premise, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, in recent years, there has been a, a line of thinking, perhaps of research, that says that telling people facts does not change their mind. It only makes them dig in deeper. It does in some cases. But first, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, the, when you say, I believe facts exist, I believe the knowable exists. And I believe that sometimes we will know it better and sometimes we will know it less well, but that we can ask what do we reasonably know given the available knowledge. And so to some extent when people use the word fact, if they hear, yes, the word equals the thing and there's absolute fidelity, then I don't like the word fact. I like the word knowable. And I think what the press is is the custodian of the knowable, but you can't have knowable.org because that would be really confusing. So, but the, one of the questions becomes when you ask about this, so how do you know that you know? And how do you communicate to someone who doesn't that you should, under these circumstances, grant that we know it? And one of the things that factcheck.org tries to do is to tell you not what you ought to know. This is not you know, a statement that is pontifical. But rather, how you would look at the available range of what can be known to draw the inference that in this circumstance, this is a good inference. And that places journalistic constraints on you because it, it's a kind of journalism that says we're going to work through what the alternatives are and make an argument for the ability to know this as it is with the appropriate links so that you can check it on your own. Now let's come back to your question. When we've got an environment in which someone's already highly polarized and they're in a partisan frame of mind, they are highly likely on that topic that is polarized to take whatever is offered and fit it into that ideology. And it's very difficult under those circumstances to get people to accept things that run counter to their identity. And you know, Dan Kahan at Yale calls it you know, identity protective processing. Uh, you could also call it motivated reasoning tied to identity. And the, so the question is, are you always in that space when you talk about that topic? Or do we all move into different kinds of cognitive space? And I'm in the second camp. I think there are circumstances under which it's all but inevitable that you're not going to be able to introduce new factual information in a way that's going to make any difference to people. They're in a highly partisan frame of mind. It's a topic about which they have decided. They've anchored the, the belief in what they believe is good, strong evidence. But I also believe that we're not partisans most of the time, although our media structure washes us through partisanship much more often now than it used to, because we now can be in a 24-hour partisan space just simply by having it in the backdrop of our world with all of this digital capacity around us and sitting in our hands. But what we've shown experimentally in a piece that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is that if I take climate 
and I look at Arctic trend lines, so Arctic sea ice trend lines, right at a topic that people don't know a lot about, but related to global warming and climate change. We can, after showing people pictures that are designed to lead to a false inference about climate, get them to come back to an understanding of the evidence. If they trust the source, in this case NASA, and they do, if we are very clear about showing them the available evidence, we're not playing any games by selectively using evidence, and if we ask them to process it across time, because here this is a cross cha time change that we're looking at, and in that context ask them what conclusions you can draw by asking them questions, most of which run in the direction of their beliefs, not the belief we're trying to move them toward so they don't have any suspicions that we are trying to change their mind, we are trying to engage the evidence. We move them out of their partisan identity into an accuracy motivation which is different. They are being treated with respect, they are engaging the evidence, and they will at the end of exposure to this process, after they've answered the questions, with the last question being, can you find any years that have you know, less Arctic sea ice than the last six? And you can't. You look across all the data from 79, the full data set, and you cannot they are more likely first to get rid of the baseline assumption that was driven in by the stimulus showing these, this short-term change, but more importantly, you bring back the liberals and the moderates to the baseline too because they were influenced by the pictures as well. It wasn't just the conservatives. And the liberals and moderates, and they weren't in this polarized space, they were over on the other side of the issue, were nonetheless influenced by these pictures to think less of a problem. So their bias that was being activated was endpoint bias. The end picture looked as if the problem was starting to solve itself. They overgeneralized the endpoint. The conservatives were overgeneralizing the endpoint, but they also had their partisan ideology. And this experimental manipulation in under two minutes can put them both at baseline. I was going to ask you how long that process two minutes. took. Two minutes. Um, and they, and now, then the question is if we reinforce that. So if we constantly, on this issue, move people into nonpartisan space and let them engage the evidence. Now, some things are too complex to do this with, but trend lines are not. And if they trust the source, can we make this move across time? I believe as a result of that kind of work that there are ways even on a highly contentious issue about people have very strong feelings to get people into an accuracy space in which they will digest key information. And now we have something in common. Now you and I can say, well, the trend line on Arctic sea ice is downward. You could also say the global, the global warming trend line is upward with you know, some plateauing but nonetheless change across time in the direction of upward in more recent years. Now that we grant that, now what can we ask ourselves in common and engage on evidence? How does carbon work in the atmosphere? What are the other factors that are involved that explain the natural variability? It isn't just a straight line down. There's variability because there are other factors at play as well. In warming, there are too. So now you and I are actually engaged in a discussion about the evidence. We haven't talked about whether we're going to have more nuclear reactors or more solar or carbon trade and capture. Once we get there, we're going to be in high-level partisan space. And we may ultimately disagree about the solutions. But the possibility of getting us to agreement on the problem is actually higher than those who work narrowly within the identity protective thesis sometimes are aware. You mentioned Dan Kahan. I heard him say at an excellent conference mm -hmm. that you put together on the science of science communication on the topic of climate change, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think I have this right. Mm -hmm. Don't ask someone to choose between what's true and who they are. Yes. And uh, is what you just described the exception to that? No, because the, and, and uh, Dan, Dan and I have actually discussed this at length. The, when I get them into the space in which they are motivated by accuracy and take, working with data that they trust from a source that they trust, NASA, the full data set, with no cues from me that I have an outcome in mind, because I am simply asking them questions about this that all work against my hypothesis, not toward my hypothesis. So if anything, I look like I'm trying to drive them to their own point of view, not away from their own point of view. The identity that they're protecting is an accuracy identity, not a partisan identity. So the place that Dan and I differ is on how likely you can get people out of partisan identity protection into this other space. But the first study on this that I found was one that Cacioppo did in psychology in which he had people in religious space and he moved them to legal space. By legal space I would call accuracy motivation, not legal space. But we meant the same thing, kind of looking at the evidence. And basically the idea was sometimes you think like you're, you're a religious person protecting your religious tradition, but sometimes you don't. And you can be in one or the other depending on what you activate, what you make salient, what you prime. You mentioned community, mm -hmm. community of belief, a term that's sort of synonymous with that, that's often invoked, mm -hmm. is tribal. Yes. And I'm just wondering, what's your reaction to the notion? Uh, what's hidden 
or uh, not so hidden in that metaphor? What's, what's in that metaphor that interests me is you know, we, we, we do get an association between tribes and all sorts of other collective activities. But we also have opened the possibility that I could be in multiple tribes simultaneously. So if as long as one says the tribe isn't your only identity, it's a useful thing to think about because it lets you think about all the things tribes are known for doing. They care for their own. This is positive. They defend their own against others. Unless tribe leads you to think other people are an opposing tribe when they're not, when you have a common enemy, the idea of thinking of ourselves as a tribe, as tribe actually has some advantages to it. Uh, but I like to think of us as multi-tribal. So I'm at USC right now, but when I'm at Penn, I'm in the Annenberg East tribe. When I'm here, I'm in the Annenberg West tribe, but we're both in the Annenberg tribe. So I'm thinking of myself as multi-tribal right now. And what we have in common is Annenberg. And a member of the Hannity tribe is also multi-tribal? Potentially. Potentially. And, and, the, and the question is, when are you part of the Hannity tribe and when are you not? And can I, on some issues, move you into other identity? We did a study on the Pope's statement on climate change. And our thought was that perhaps the Pope would be able to take those who are conservatives and get them to re-identify on climate because they're also Catholics with a Pope's message. Now, the assumption there is there are two different identities. Catholic and conservative can have differences. They are not necessarily synonymous. Liberal can be Catholic too. And you can have Catholics who are liberals and Catholics who are conservatives. And we were looking to see, now the liberals who are Catholics aren't that happy about the Pope's statements on some issue. Priests can't marry, you know, abortion is prohibited, et cetera, et cetera. Birth control is not legitimate. Uh, but conservatives don't like the Pope on some issues. So you know, popes don't like death penalty, for example. So. This is a very interesting case because there actually were the po was the possibility that the Catholic people, piece of the Pope would speak to the conservative part of the conservative Catholics and say, Catholics believe this, that is stewardship of the earth and we have moral obligations to each other and they're climate refugees. And what we found was that in the main, what the conservative Catholics did was said, we love you, Pope. Really important that you're, you know, we're with you on all these important social issues, but you're no expert in science. So that meant that the tribe that was the conservative part was not influenced by the pope as leader of the part that was Catholic, and they engaged in classic dissonance reduction. They didn't discredit the source as pope. They discredited the pope on the science issue. So you mentioned the pope. That brings up one of the more notorious pieces of viral disinformation yeah. that the pope supported uh, Trump. Uh, leads me to uh, think about a piece that was in the New York Times mm -hmm. today uh, about the perfection and perfectibility of the uh, software to create what are called deep fakes, yeah. that it's now within the resources of just about everybody, it's getting better and better, and that there will come a time in which it will be virtually, maybe the word is accurately used there, mm -hmm. impossible to distinguish when you encounter it whether a mm -hmm. source is the branded source you think you're getting. Now, and we are, we are wired over evolution to trust what we see. And at the point at which you get three-dimensional realities that we are experiencing that have been so artfully created that we, we detect them at every visceral level as being reality, we may actually be experiencing an alternative world that you cannot propositionally attack. So the, the response to that is going to be very, very challenging. And one question first is, will we be able to detect it? And are there ways to imprint reality so that as you make those moves to alter it, there is some signaling under that at some clever engineering nano level that ultimately lets us say, this is real and this isn't, because our primitive human processing isn't going to be able to do it. That's the next front in deception. And, it, the, and it's, going to be, it's going to be used in all domains, not just the political domain. This is predictable, and we are extraordinarily vulnerable to it. And this is as we move into an, an IE world in which all sorts of things are going to be created that have kinds of capacities that thwart you human information processing. Um, I think it was Putin who said the next challenge globally is the IE challenge. I think it was Elon Musk who said on behalf of the United States, bring it on, which was one of the more bizarre exchanges um, because you would have expected our president of the United States to stand up and say, bring it on. 
And as I thought about Elon Musk's car just circling up there somewhere <laughs> with the suit of the astronaut in it, um, the idea that, that he would take this on for us actually gave me some sense of, of satisfaction because it was sufficiently strange that this person put a car into space that I thought maybe he'd be inventive in order to try to help us figure this thing out. I appreciate your letting me end on a note of hope. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen Hall Jameson. You're welcome.